Uh, my name is Benjamin, and I was asked to share with you all five minutes or so of my experience with Raja Yoga meditation. And this presents a unique situation, because if there's any mathematicians out there, five minutes is 300 seconds. So I have 300 seconds to share with you 30 some odd years of my life and three of the most meaningful, magical years that I've most recently experienced. And I thought maybe I should walk the river and plan something along those lines. But as we've noticed, speaking from experience and speaking from the heart is often the most effective. So here I am, standing or sitting in front of you now with my heart open, ready to share with you my experience. And what I've discovered with Raja Yoga and with meditation in general is that it is the very opposite of what the world is this day and age. The world around us kind of tells us we have to seek, we have to obtain, we have to expand, and we have to acquire in order to meet the basic needs of our own happiness. And I knew from very early in life, uh, growing up on the west coast of California, that this wasn't meant for me. And I had two essential questions that I had to answer. Who am I and why am I here? So I rifled my way through all the major religious texts, philosophical studies, and all the great pieces of literature written both in the East and the West. And every time I came to a conclusive understanding, I found myself slightly disappointed because no one could actually definitively tell me who I was and why I was here. But I could taste the truth in the air and I knew that when I would find it, the aroma would smell of truth, smell of a fact. And of all the places in the world, I wound up in the deserts of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates and there is where I stumbled into a place called Inner Space. And I sat down and someone looked me right in the eyes and said, I'm going to tell you who you are and why you're here. And I kicked my feet up, put my hand on my chin and said, oh, okay, let's see. I'm excited. And the truth is, answers were provided. And it's not a static answer. It's not a permanent thing. What it is is an ever-evolving return to the essence of who we are and why we're here, which in the end are the two big philosophical and religious questions of our human phenomenon. And I don't want to answer those for you now because this is a journey you have to take on your own, but I could tell you that the way in which we operate in this 21st century of trying to speak our way into a truth or move our way into a profound understanding is the very hallmark of what has caused the discontent of this world today. Because in all truth, the meditative path, that of Raj Yoga, isn't a study of sound, but a study of silence. And it isn't a practice of movement but an inculcation of stillness. And by doing so, you isolate the variables of the world and you center yourself on the way your mind works. And you start to discover truly who you are, where you come from, why you're here, and what you can do with your remaining blessings on this earth. So I am privileged to share with you all that there are answers out there and I'm sure you'll be shined on to some of them today. But it requires a certain level of discipline, a certain level of inquiry, and a certain level of passion. But once you have those, I can promise you, you will discover exactly what it is that you're meant to find. And when you do, when you go within, when you calm your mind, when you sustain a powerful thought, it's the most powerful thing in the world. Nothing is more empowering. So instead of seeking our happiness 
from without. Instead of looking for truth from a scripture or from someone on television or someone who sits where I'll be sitting shortly. Here with Raja Yoga, you're given the tools and the skill set to go within, to calm your mind, to focus your thoughts, and through a rarefied concentration, discover the sweetness, the peace, the beauty that you are. So the fact that you walked through those doors today is a mighty blessing. And I hope you know that it was destined to be so. So may you take from this all that you can. May you walk slowly. May you breathe deeply. And may you know that everything that's ever happened, as corny as it may be, happened so that you can be here right now and take in the nectar of this knowledge. Sound good? Om Shanti. Good evening. I'll be presenting a song before you. And the song's name is How Far I'll Go by Oli Caravallo. been standing at the edge of water long as I can remember never really knowing why I wish I could be the perfect daughter but I come back to the water no matter how hard I try every turn I take every trail I track every track I Every road leads back to the place I know where I cannot go, though I long to be. See the line where the sky meets the sea, it calls me, and no one knows how far it goes. If the wind in my sail on the sea stays behind me, one day I'll know. If I go, there's just no telling how far I'll go. Oh, 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 I know everybody on this island seems so happy on this island. Everything is by design. I know. Everybody on this island has a role on this island So maybe I can roll with mine I can, pre can make a strong I'd be satisfied if I play along But the voice inside sings a different song What is wrong with me? See the light as it shines on the sea It's blinding But no one knows how deep it goes And it seems like it's calling out to me So come find me And let me know What's beyond that line? Will I cross that line? See the line where the sky meets the sea It calls me And no one knows How deep it goes If the wind in my sail on the sea stays behind me one day I'll know how far I'll go First of all, wow, thank you to Brother Benjamin for sharing so openly and honestly, and Sister Shivangi for the song. We're delighted to have today at Harmony House Sister Genti, the European Director of the Brahma Kumaris and NGO representative to the United Nations Geneva. Please welcome Sister Genti.
Om Shanti. Greeting of peace to my sisters and my brothers, and good evening. There are several words of the Hindi language that have come into the English language, and they've passed in such a way that we don't even realize that they're actually from India. <laughs> they're just part of the natural English language now. But there are two words in particular that have been used across the globe. And they're not translated, they're kept as they are, but not everybody understands their significance. The first word is yoga. Whether I go to Japan or Brazil or anywhere else in between, the word yoga is yoga, no translation needed. But not many people know that it actually means union. They know that it's something to do with postures and exercises and so on, and in fact that's part of the story, but it's not the essential story. And yoga actually means union of the self with the divine. And another word that's also come into languages across the world is this word karma. <laughs> and what does that mean? In a very simple translation, it just means action. That's it. But on another level, people use it in a different context. They use it in the context of cause and effect. And they know usually that if you're talking about karma, it's the repercussion today of something that I've done before. So I don't know what it is I did, but I'm seeing the impact and the results now. And sometimes we are also very aware that whatever it is I do today is going to impact my own future. And so what is destiny? Destiny is whatever I choose to create. And so one thought can change destiny. One thought can take me in a direction which uplifts me and is of benefit to everybody else around me. And yet another type of thought can bring me down and also I pull down many others with myself. And so cause and effect is not just action, but cause and effect is my thoughts, my words, my actions, my intentions. We don't always think about intention as being part of karma. But in fact, the whole question of what is good karma or what isn't good karma depends actually on intention. And so let's explore the whole tapestry of karma. Because today we are in a situation where we are connected with many people, whether on a personal level or whether through our devices, but it's many, many connections we have across the world. And people we are close to, sometimes we are not able to meet them, they're far away. And so what is all that about? and people we are not very deeply connected with, we find ourselves with them day and night. So there is really this tapestry of all sorts of things going on, which if you look on the surface, yes, it may be very beautiful or it may not be. But you see a picture, a clear picture. But if you were to turn around the other side, what you would see is many, many different colored threads. And it would be very difficult to trace which thread came in and went out and where the other one did and so on and so on and so on. And so when we look at the tapestry of our lives, we begin to wonder what made all of this happen? And so yes, definitely, we're responsible not just for our future destiny, but, and sometimes it sounds beautiful and sometimes it sounds very challenging, but we are also responsible for the picture of life that we find ourselves in at the present moment. To accept responsibility is not easy. 
I'd much rather say, well, things happen just by chance. But in fact, they don't. <laughs> Nothing happens by chance. There's a synchronicity at work that makes things move in a very specific way. And so you think of someone and they call you, or you think of someone and you meet them. So how did all that happen? Our thoughts are linked together. Our vibrations are linked together. Our connections bring us together. So all of that is the picture of karma. To try and make a complicated subject as simple as possible, um, let me offer three different types of karma and you can see how things begin to work together or fit together. So firstly, there's an expression that they use in India called Sukkarma. And that means karma that gives happiness to all. Su, Suk and Karma. So karma that which brings happiness. And then there's another word, not so nice, but important to understand. And that's the word Vikkarma. And Vikkarma is action that's based on negativity. And specifically, Vikkarma, Vikkarma is vice. And vice includes all the negative things, the lust, the anger, the greed, the attachment, the ego, and then all the other little ones, the jealousy, the envy, the laziness, the carelessness, the excuses, all of that is all the ten things combined together and anything based on any one of these or under the influence of any one of these things. And then there's Vikarma. And as a result of karma, which is negative karma, then the result is going to be, the outcome of that is going to be sorrow. Maybe not immediately sorrow for myself. Maybe what I'm seeing is sorrow for others. <clears throat> Simple example, I take more than my fair share. And so what I need is something else. What I want is something else. <laughs> And so I'm taking more than my fair share. And so that touch of greed that's motivating me at that moment, at that moment I don't realize that it's bringing me sorrow. At that moment definitely it's causing sorrow to another because if I'm taking more than my share, there's going to be deprivation somewhere along the line further down. But in fact, it's not only causing sorrow to others, it's also going to cause me sorrow. Because my greed is going to always leave me in a state of feeling lack of attainment. If I can be content with what I actually need, that contentment is going to bring me happiness. And if I'm taking more than I need, at that moment I think, well, why not? It's there, I can help myself to it. And so I take it. But it actually doesn't satisfy me. It leaves me wanting more. <laughs> Have you noticed that? And the more I want, the more I receive, the more I want yet again. And if I can simplify my needs and just have enough and feel contentment, there can be many things on offer, but I'll say, I have enough, and this is for others to share. There's a statement by Mahatma Gandhi, which I've been remembering a lot recently, not just because India is honoring 150 years of the Mahatma's birth anniversary, but also because it's very connected with sustainable development. And when we look at climate change and the environment, then the big sub subject that comes up in front of us is how sustainably are we living? How sustainable is development happening? And it isn't, of course. We see that. It's very clear. It's visible. And the fact that injustice grows and the discrepancy and the um, difference between the haves and the have-nots becomes bigger and bigger 
instead of moving towards equity and justice, we seem to be moving further and further away. And so given that condition, then yes, the Mahatma's words come to mind. There's enough for everyone's need, but not enough for even one person's greed. And so two people holding as much amount of wealth as the whole of the developing world and crazy statistics like that and worse that you hear all the time, you can see how there's a huge imbalance in the world. And so karma has sort of become a little bit topsy-turvy. And so vikarma, where there's greed and maybe I didn't even think of it as greed. I saw it as an opportunity, but I was accumulating. And so that accumulation is going to cause me anxiety and worry and not bring me happiness and contentment. So that's one little example, but vikarma, anything that has the influence or intention of negativity, and there's going to be sorrow. And then there's a third category of karma, which we don't actually often come across. It's very rare. And in a way, it doesn't belong to this time period because in the period that we are in now, and it's interesting to see what period we are in now, some of you know these terms, Satyug, Treta Yug, Dwapur Yug, Kali Yug, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Copper Age, the Iron Age. And so they're descriptive of the state of the world. So the Golden Age, the beauty, the Silver Age, wonderful, but just a touch less the Copper Age and already the tarnish begins and metal changes its colour and the Iron Age and there's rust, there's poison and there's darkness. So that's in a few words a description of all of that. So where would you say we are at the current time? Who thinks we're in the Golden Age? No one. <laughs> Who thinks we're in the Silver Age? Anyone? Copper Age? Iron Age? Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely, yes. It's an age of darkness and it's an age in which everything is a little bit rusty. You touch something and there might be poison there. So the water we drink, the air we breathe, who knows what's going on nowadays. All of this absolutely, absolutely tainted. Anyway, so it's the Iron Age. But it's not just the Iron Age. There's something more interesting than that. It's actually the confluence. It's the confluence between the end of the Iron Age and the beginning of the Golden Age. So that's the good news. <laughs> so although it feels as if we have been in a period of darkness for a long time, and we have, it's actually time for the transition, time for the movement back to the Golden Age, to that period in which the soul is completely pure and unblemished. So here in this junction point, we're looking at the story of karma. And we're seeing that there are huge forces that pull us down, but our own motivation, our own passion, our own vision can carry us upwards. And so the sukkarma, the good karma, is the karma that's going to be uplifting for me and everybody else around me. And if I say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. What difference does it make? What can one individual do anyway? It's not going to have any impact. And so if I just sit back and there's inertia, then I'm going to be pulled down by the forces of negativity around me. And I'm going to be influenced by sorrow. I'm going to be giving sorrow and taking sorrow. We've been through that for a long time now. But now time to go on that upward journey, the ascent. And so, a karma, neutral karma, isn't really part of the story at this moment. This is why 
I was explaining to you about the cycle. That state in which whatever it is I do is just natural and it is as it is, but there's no negative reaction, but neither is there anything positive. So it's a state of karma in which there's no reaction of any form. And so that's not of this period, but another dimension of time. And so now we have this opportunity to do lots and lots and lots of good karma because I want to uplift myself, I want to empower myself, I want to be able to know that each thought, each word, each action is going to carry me forward to the destination that I hold in front of me. And we can describe that destination in many different ways. We can call it the state of total purity. We can call it the state in which I've settled all past karma and now I'm only carrying with myself the power of goodness, the power of good karma. That would be another description of that state. Some people would say it's a state in which the highest potential of the soul has been reached and is being expressed in life. So it's not just something abstract, but I've reached that state which is the highest state and now I'm actually revealing it, showing it, demonstrating it in my life and in my behavior. And so that's also possible. And so now, on a day-to-day -day basis, where does the balance sheet lie? What is the balance of my day? Well, at this point, I start with quite a backlog. <laughs> they say that when a child is born, the child brings with itself karma from the past. And if I think that the child comes with a clean slate, then of course there's many, many questions that arise about the differences of situation. A child in a gardener's hut, and what is the future destiny? A child at the same moment, so the constellation of stars is the same for that one and this one, but just a few feet away, the child born inside the mansion and the destiny appears to be quite different. And so what was happening there? Who decided? And so karma and rebirth and the two stories are deeply connected. It's difficult to talk about the story of karma without thinking about past births and future births. And I don't really want to go into too much detail about rebirth but just to put it into the context of the story of karma. So they say that when a child is born, the child is born according to past karma. This is how I'm born to these parents and not to these, or this other child is born here and not here. So already there's pluses and minuses that we begin with. Injustice? Well, the story of karma is beautiful because at the end of the day, even though there may seem to have been periods of injustice and inequity, yet in fact the story of karma is of perfect justice. Absolutely no question about it. This is how the whole universe is able to move in harmony and unison. If the story of karma were not of justice, there would be chaos in the universe. <laughs> but everything in the universe is actually very well ordered, just as with the physical body, the microcosm and the macro. In the microcosm, everything is balanced in such an amazing way that we don't think about it. And it's only when something goes slightly wrong 
that it begins to create discomfort and that sends us off on a track to find out well what's wrong, what's going on and maybe something in here a nerve, a muscle something is not aligned is not in the place that it should be isn't working and functioning in the way that it was with harmony with everything around it and there's discomfort, maybe even pain, maybe very severe pain the macrocosm, the same absolutely everything is aligned nothing out of place, absolutely nothing and so the story of karma is the same nothing out of line, nothing out of place absolutely fitting into the scheme of justice on all levels and so nobody decided about this child here and that child there but the story of karma from the past continues in the present and so what are the situations that babies get born into? a different state of inherent intelligence and yes I'm totally aware that whatever factors brings the child here then from this moment on it's not just the gifts or the challenges that the child brings with itself but from this moment on it's also the present choices that are made and so education the gardener's child might decide that I really want to study and might achieve amazing things the child in the mansion might think well I've got everything so why do I need to bother? <laughs> so what's going to be the destiny of that child? so it's not written in stone it's absolutely from this moment on I bring some gifts, I bring some challenges but how do I deal with each of these things? but there's an inherent intelligence that as I'd say a soul, not just a child the soul brings with itself then there seems to be another factor and that factor seems to be of health and you see some children born with very severe challenges and some children born absolutely fine so that seems to be a connection not of the present but something to do with the past a third factor quality of relationships and whether the child is welcomed into a family with love or whether a child is born and maybe actually not wanted at all or maybe well now that the child has come I suppose we have to take care of the child <laughs> so a reluctance and a feeling of pressure rather than pure love and that's nothing to do whether it's the gardener's hut or the mansion the child in the mansion might be feeling very unwanted because the parents really don't have time to look after their children <laughs> they're too busy with many other things but maybe it could be the other way that the gardener is so occupied just with scratching a living that there's no time for play there's no time for just the gentle experiences that life needs and so either way but certainly the quality of relationships is connected very much with the past and the child brings that destiny with itself another factor wealth little bit not enough a lot and there could be all sorts of other ramifications maybe the child who's born into great wealth is just given fancy toys to play with rather than the actual company of the mother and father and the engagement and the development that happens through that engagement that the child needs so you can see that there's many many different factors that are at work but certainly these four ingredients that really nobody can determine and nobody can predict 
but this is the story of karma. And then from the moment that the child is conscious and that consciousness, yes, until a certain age, the child is absorbing all the impressions that life is throwing at the child, good and not so good, feelings of rejection, abandonment, or warmth and security and love, many different experiences, sometimes one, sometimes the other maybe, but all of those are being absorbed by the soul and they're even being absorbed by the body. But then there comes a time when the child begins to actively make decisions, not just being put in one place and left to its own devices or not just somebody deciding to pick up and play and then, then they decide. The child doesn't really have much choice in all of that. It can express its feelings, <laughs> but sometimes the feelings are heard and sometimes ignored. But there does come a very specific moment when the child becomes aware that certain actions seem to bring a reward and certain actions don't bring the reward that the child wants. <laughs> and can be age two, age three, something in that area. And beyond that further, when a child very consciously understands that yes, I can do this, and if I do this, there'll be a strong no. What is the feeling of the child at that time? Again, so much of environment and parents and influence comes into play here. But I want you to think about something else that's happening. Sometimes I know that mothers, fathers are very, very occupied and it's real. It's not just that they've taken on more, but the way life is. And so they use television as the babysitter. And they use cartoons, thinking that, well, this is safe, this is okay. But the things that children pick up from cartoons is violence sometimes. Whenever I, I don't consciously switch on a television, then I don't have one at home. <laughs> but traveling, you, you've got things on the screen or around you, in front of you. And I just see the amount of violence there is in all sorts of movies, but also in cartoons. <laughs> and so, unconsciously, this is what the child is absorbing. And so karma is sometimes not conscious choice, but karma is the situation that my past karma has brought me into. And I think parents are now more and more aware of what's going on. There was a period of time when there was a very simple system of parenting and life wasn't so complicated and that was much easier. And then there came a time when all these amazing inventions came to the fore and technology took over. And now I think parents know better and they restrict children's screen time they're aware of the nourishment that's being provided to the brain and the soul through the things that they're watching. And so they're more careful about all of this. So all of these things are impacting the way I think, the way I feel, the way I respond. And all of this is part of the story of karma. You can begin to see the complexities of all of this. And then a certain point where I actually have the freedom to make my own choices about the karma that I'm going to engage in. And from that time on, I take up the pen in my hand and I start drawing the line of my own destiny, my own fortune. I'll begin with intention. 
the action might be a very simple one. I'm offering my mother some flowers. But what was the intention? <laughs> and a child's intentions become very quickly revealed. Intentions of adults can be masked, <laughs> but the mother can very quickly spot what the intentions of the child are. <laughs> And maybe the intention is really, truly, just sheer love. <laughs> Wonderful. And so the mother accepts the flowers that are being given in that spirit and gives the child a big hug and a big kiss in return. And sometimes the mother is aware that the child has been up to some mischief <laughs> and it's time to talk about it and to prepare the ground the child's intelligent enough to know, well, let me get some flowers and offer these, and it'll make it a little bit easier. <laughs> and the mother, if she's also smart, she'll say, okay, let me take it at face value. <laughs> and so she'll accept the flowers with love and sit down and say, okay, come, tell me what are you thinking about? What is it that's on your mind? And so intention, good karma, Maybe it wasn't negative karma to have a specific intention, but maybe it could have been worse. Maybe it was negative. So intention colors the quality of karma. And that's then also going to bring the return. How often is it that we try to please God with money, making promises, giving up things. I will do this if you do this. <laughs> and the question there is, again, intention. <clears throat> Was it pure love that made me say, I'm really going to spend time in deep prayer tonight or tomorrow early morning just simply because I want to communicate with God? Or is it that, well, maybe if I spend a little bit of extra time on my prayers tonight, maybe I'll pass my exams. <laughs> or whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> so again, motive in karma. And it's more of a business deal rather than pure love and bhakti. The word bhakti can be very beautiful. Bhakti is the devotion, the love with which I come to God and create a connection with God or I do something for God. And the other is a trade. I will do this if you will do this for me. And at some point in our lives, we've probably all been guilty of that. <laughs> But now, if really I want from my heart just to be able to communicate with my eternal parent because I can feel that I've been very distant for a long time and now my inner thirst is really to be able to come closer and experience the beauty of that relationship. And the more I do this, create that connection with the divine, there's something else very, very interesting that happens that we didn't know about really. Maybe there's lots of mistakes I've made and the things of this birth I can remember quite clearly. If I give myself an opportunity to sit in silence, I know what I've done from definitely age three onwards but sometimes even flashes of memory from age two come back. But the mistakes I've made, how do I atone for them? How can I settle that karma? And yes, if it involves another human being, let me seek forgiveness. But it's not just human forgiveness that I need to seek. I need to seek that, that's important because it was in the context of this connection. But I also have to deeply realize that I want to change. And that commitment to change 
has to be expressed in the connection with the One. And not only then is it an expression of commitment, but it's also then opening the door to be able to receive power so that I can change. Sometimes we have a very strong commitment, but we don't actually change. And that's because we then lack the power. And the external influences of the world today are generally, generally negative influences. And I mean not just from people, but all the media that we are surrounded by all the time. All that has a huge influence and is usually negative. Making me buy more, making me think that, well, violence is totally acceptable, it's part of the world. All these things. And in the connection of yoga, my pure desire to have a relationship with the Divine and to be able to have that experience of union, it's yoga that generates the fire of love, the fire of purity that's going to cleanse me of all the things that I may have done, the things that I remember, the things that I don't remember, conscious, unconscious, but the cleansing of karma happens through the fire of yoga. And most times when people say, oh, I'd like to learn to meditate, it's become a sort of fashionable thing. Yes, yes, I meditate. <laughs> but whatever level of meditation it is I'm doing, whichever type of meditation I'm doing, if I'm really interested in sorting out karma from the past, and there's a very simple way to know when I have settled the karma from the past, and I'll come to that in a minute. But the only way to settle the karma from the past is through a very deep form of meditation, which is then called yoga, the union, the union of the soul with God, and that then cleanses and purifies the soul. It's an example that's given in the scriptures in the East and also in the New Testament. And it's the example of alloy being mixed within the gold or the silver. And when the alloy is put into intense fire, all the impurities come out. And God says to human beings through the scriptures, I won't leave you alone as you go through that process of purification and cleansing. I'll hold your hand and stay with you through it all. Because when you're going through a process of transformation, it's a challenge. What you were before, you're not that now, but you haven't yet got to the stage where you want to be. Just think about it, here's some gold, and even though it was mixture, it was alloy gold, at least it had some shape, some form. Now, as it's going through the process of transformation, it's molten. There's no shape, there's no form. And so sometimes you're going through the cleansing process, you wonder, what's going on? How long is this going to take? What is it I can do? What's happening? But it's okay. Faith, trust, knowing that if I've put myself into God's hands and put myself into this fire of love and yoga, at the end of it, it's going to be perfection. The alloy is removed and the pure silver or the pure gold remains and then it can be fashioned into something very, very beautiful by the jeweler. And so, yes, there's something beautiful at the end of that journey. And so the settling of past karma, and the wonderful thing is that whether I believe in past births or I don't, never mind, but all the karma I've ever done, and for me that definitely includes past births also, but 
all of that karma and things of the present can all be cleansed. And so it isn't that something is fixed, that there's going to be constant suffering or constant sorrow, but the process of transformation with God allows us to come back to our original state of purity. How do I know that the things of the past have been settled? When there's been good karma, it's sowing seeds for the future, but also the immediate feeling that I get when I know that this is good karma, it's given me happiness, it's given happiness to others, the immediate feeling is of contentment. The immediate feeling is of being at peace with myself and the happiness that this brings. And the immediate return of negative karma, at some point along the line, there's sorrow, usually immediately, sometimes a bit later, but also it creates a pattern. The thing about my thinking is that I set up a pattern and that pattern creates feelings and my feelings create reactions. And so my thoughts lead to certain types of reactions in situations. And I do something once, but it's never just once. But it's a pattern that's at first very, very subtle that I don't even perceive, but it gets repeated and the pattern becomes stronger and stronger and at a certain point we call it a habit and at a certain point we call it addiction. And so there's an addiction cycle and I'm not just talking about substances, that's the same thing, the same story. But I'm talking also about the negative traits of ego and anger and attachments and so on. And so my negative karma has created a pattern. And the power of good karma also creates patterns, but that brings with itself many, many virtues. But on this side, now that I understand that the fire of yoga can cleanse me, what am I going to do? I can feel how the thoughts that are coming are not the usual thoughts. As the karma is being settled, it's easier and easier for my mind to have pure, elevated thoughts. You're with me? So the proof that my karma is being settled, I'm not having to struggle with negativity in my mind. Now, pure, elevated thoughts are more and more natural, and this is what's being reflected in my behavior. And so the transformation, which is both inner and subtle that I know about, but also external and visible, that others can also see is a proof of transformation and the proof of my yoga. And the good karma, new patterns. And when it's good karma that's bringing happiness, it's connected with the original qualities of the soul. The negative actions were acquired tendencies. These weren't the original patterns of the soul. These were acquired later on. But the original qualities of the soul, and every tradition would agree that the soul in its original state has peace and love and truth, purity and joy. Agree? So these are the qualities of that pure state of being. And so when I'm doing good karma, the peace is emerging, the love, the truth are emerging, the purity and the joy are manifest. And so 
the transformation is a visible transformation. I was a very angry person and today I can feel that that heat of anger has dissolved. It's not just my intention, but it's my yoga. Because we begin every new year with very good intentions. But how quickly do they dissolve? <laughs> Pretty fast. <laughs> Sooner than I would like. So it needs power. And we usually don't know how to gain inner power. Empowerment in a good atmosphere, empowerment in good company, of course, all that works. But it's usually short-lived. Then finally, at some point, you're left to your own devices, just you on your own. But when I learn to connect with the divine and draw the power, the spiritual power that's available to me, that power is something I can access at all times doesn't depend on others, doesn't depend on situations, wherever I am, and can be sitting on the tube train, I can be sitting in the traffic jam and connect, and I can draw that power. And so, in the drawing of that power, the old karma is getting settled, the negativity that I was carrying, that gets finished, and now there's nothing but good karma, a slow process, but the anger that I felt, that's dissolving, it's going. Now I'm more at peace with myself and therefore with others. No more control issues. Anyone have control issues? <laughs> it's interesting, but we don't always realize that we do have control issues. And yet, I think, to a certain percentage or another, we do. <laughs> and maybe it's not so much controlling many others. Maybe it's just control of my nearest ones, the dearest ones. <laughs> but definitely control issues are part of our makeup at this time. Why? Because there's an insecurity in the soul. And insecurities are there in every single soul in this time of the Iron Age, where the soul is very, very depleted. And so insecurities are there. And this is why I say, when there's insecurity, then it gets manifest as trying to control externally. And so both go together. But how do I change it? Again, you hear of self-development places telling you, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> but not so easy. But when I change the insecurity inside to come back to a sense of self-worth, to come back to a sense of self-esteem and value, the insecurities fade away. I'm secure in my own identity. I'm secure and stable in the awareness of my own inner value and the values that I carry within myself. And so, no more control issues. <laughs> A change happens through that power, through that silence, through that awareness. And so, why we chose beauty of karma as a title is because this is that time in which I can change the whole tapestry and create a very beautiful one of my choice in the way that I would really like. I can sort out all the karma of the past without the angst and the conflict that sometimes comes when it's two people trying to settle karma. But in fact, the other side of the picture is that if I'm in conflict with somebody, is that really settling karma? Don't think so. <laughs> Why? Because, yes, we don't match together very well. Because there's karma from the past. The give and, day, the give and take wasn't quite balanced. And so today 
there's an imbalance there and so it's creating conflict. But if I engage in conflict, even in thoughts, and my thoughts are whizzing around, like this one, why are they doing this? They shouldn't be doing that. I'm actually creating more karma with that individual. Interesting, isn't it? I haven't said anything to them, but my mind is racing. And of course, people pick up vibrations. My thoughts are creating vibrations. And so the angst that I'm feeling inside and the pressure that I'm creating for myself by too many thoughts and negative thinking, it's actually creating karmic bondage. But sooner or later, it's going to express itself in words. And so I come into words, and there's more karmic bondage. Hopefully it doesn't reach the state of actions, but it, if it does, it's even more bondage. And so conflict never settles karma. It generates more karma. On the other side, okay, there's something from the past, don't know when, don't know how, but there's something, and I'm not in resonance with this individual. There's a dissonance that's there, a friction that exists. Can I say to myself, be my own teacher, and tell myself, okay, there's something that's not quite right there. Can I hold that soul in light? Let me stay in the awareness of my own eternal identity as a being of light and hold that individual in light. And if I hold them in light, then when I come into contact with them, it's going to be light. That sense of a relationship based on lightness is going to impact both of us. And you'll have settled that karma without conflict. It works. My, my thoughts can settle karma. My thoughts can create karmic bondage. And when I'm on a spiritual journey, then what I want to do is to settle. <laughs> if I can be in a position of giving rather than taking, and now I'm not talking about external things, I'm talking about the subtle internal things. I want your respect. And not just you, but everybody around me. And if I'm not getting that respect, my neediness is that, my insecurity is that I get upset. And then I react. More karma, more karma all along. I ask myself the question, why do I need anybody else's respect? Is it possible for me to go deep within myself recognize who I am, connect with the Divine, and fill myself with all that I need so that I can be stable in self-respect and I don't need to be taking. It's possible. There's a method. <laughs> the method is knowing myself, knowing the Divine, and working with that awareness. And then another step. Can I be a giver instead of a taker. Because every time I'm taking, it's more karma, more karma. And at some point, somewhere along the line, there'll be a settlement that's due. <laughs> but if I can start giving, let me give respect, love. Can I give love, not just to one, two, four individuals, but can I give love and express love to everyone I'm in contact with. And the expression of love then is not a hug or a kiss, but the expression of love is that openness, that generosity, a desire to share, the ability to listen. So love can be expressed in all of these different ways, but it's an inclusive love. And it's one in which 
I can give. I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty for love, and I'm not seeking to take. And when I'm seeking to take, again, not just in the relationship with God does devotion and bhakti become a trade, but human relationships. <laughs> how much is it pure, loving relationships, and how much is it a trade again? <laughs> so, understanding karma means understanding that it's a whole process of giving and taking. Everything, everything that's going on, it's giving and taking giving and taking energy, giving and taking vibrations, and in the best possible way, just simply sharing God's love, God's vibrations. And if at this moment of time, I can, on the one side, have that experience of transformation through the fire of love, the fire of yoga, and on the other side, focus on pure elevated thoughts, good wishes for others. I might not be able to give someone my time, my money, anything, but what I can give them are my good wishes. And they'll say to me, I could feel your support. I could feel your good wishes reaching me. But of course, instead of good wishes, our mind is in the habit of a lot of other feelings <laughs> and so a cleansing to settle the story of karma and to create a beautiful tapestry of good karma at this moment needs a bit of cleaning <laughs> and so good feelings and that definitely is good karma and if I look at the state of the world and Individual karma, personal karma is one thing, but just looking at the state of the world, can I send out thoughts of God's love and God's light to the whole human family? Yes, at times one person is sick and I send them God's light and love and it helps them and they can feel it. That something reached me and this isn't just imagination there's a lot of research being done on these topics now and so there's actual research evidence that when people have been prayed for they recover and control groups where no one was praying for them and it isn't the same story and when people get to know this they why was nobody praying for me <laughs> and so then we say okay we'll pray for you too <laughs> But um, it's a fact that good wishes, pure remembrance of God, prayer, good vibrations reach. But never mind one or two or a few individuals, whether it's physical healing or inner emotional healing, who doesn't need healing at this moment in history. And so can I spend a few minutes of my time each day in yoga not just yoga for myself in which I'm empowering myself and taking God's light and love for myself I need that but every day just a few minutes good karma would definitely be sending out my thoughts of God's light and love to the whole human family so that we may all be healed but not just the human family. What about all the other species? <laughs> We've inflicted all sorts of violence on all the other species. And so time for healing that also. So to send out healing thoughts of God's light and love to all the other species. Thoughts of peace, so that violence against other species may stop and nature, nature itself, we've exploited nature. Time to send our thoughts of God's light and love to our planet. It has supported us since the beginning of time and we may disappear, but the planet is gonna carry on. But if we want to continue to survive and 
experience the continuing abundance of nature, we need to do something positive. All our karma with nature so far has generally been quite negative, just taking exploitation. And so now, to send our thoughts of God's light and love to nature, so that nature is able to heal. We've disrupted the whole cycle of ecology. And so we need to allow that to heal also. And then, yes, when nature has been cleansed and purified, nature will work in harmony with humanity. The other species will work in harmony with human beings. The lion and the lamp will, live, will drink water together at the same pool. But that good karma and the opportunity to do good karma is now. One last thing before I close the subject and we spend some time in meditation. One-to-one -one karma, when it's good karma, when I want to share happiness is great. But imagine if that seed of good karma is strengthened, is reinforced, is enhanced, then the fruits of that one seed are multiplied. And we've seen that in the Green Revolution in harvests. When seeds can be enhanced, the harvest is greater. And in spiritual terms, this means not just the awareness of and the pure intention of doing good karma, but doing karma in God's remembrance. When that action is filled with the power of God's remembrance, it multiplies a hundredfold, and the results are a hundredfold. And so at this moment, as we are in this period of transition, we can take advantage of this, connect with the divine, settle the things of the past, but fill every thought with God's power so that the actions we perform are filled with that power. When you're in God's awareness and you speak, what is the quality of what you say? What is the impact of what you say? And if you're just speaking out of your own cleverness, what happens then? <laughs> so really, these are things to experiment with. And it's a complex subject. And rather than invite questions, I'd rather that we actually spend time in reflection and silence. Is that OK? I'll speak out my own thoughts in meditation and invite you to follow these ideas. Sitting quietly, I'm aware that my thoughts have an impact, an impact on I, the soul, an impact on the atmosphere, an impact on the people around me. And so I carefully choose the type of thoughts I would like to have now. I choose the thought of peace. And in this awareness of peace, I can feel the atmosphere being charged further with peace, but also in this awareness of peace, I can feel the presence of the divine. I connect with the supreme the being of light, the source of light, of peace, of love, of truth.
truth. And in the presence of the Divine, the highest within the soul emerges. God's light allows me to see myself, to know myself, and to come to the experience of the eternal identity of the self as a being of light. Connecting with the source of light, I also feel the love the pure, unconditional love of the Supreme, the love that washes away the dust I've accumulated so that I can shine the love that's able to cleanse me and heal me, empower me, and uplift me. And the power of this love radiates out to the entire human family. And the power of this love transforms the darkness into light. And we hold this light within ourselves. We hold this peace within ourselves. And we come back to the awareness of the physical domain. that now carrying this peace and this light and love. <coughs> so that we can be instruments to share this in all our actions and interactions. Om Shanti. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Genti, for sharing. Lots to think about. I'd just like to bring to your attention two courses that are taking place over the next week things to build on from today's talk. The first is entitled Healthy Mind, Healthy Planet, and that will be next Friday in the auditorium in the evening. The second is a Raj Yoga course next weekend on Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th of July. It's the whole day and a lunch will be provided, but we will be running an English Raj Yoga meditation course and a Hindi Raj Yoga Meditation course. All courses are offered free of charge,
but if you'd like to know more details of the courses available over July, August and September, please take a leaflet from reception. If you haven't already paid a visit, please visit the Inner Space Bookshop, which is downstairs, or even visit the quiet room next door, where you can experience a gentle meditation. And in the Inner Space Bookshop, there are talks, books, CDs by Sister Genti, and also um, Sister Shivani. Many of you may have um, recently seen her in Leicester on her European Awakening Tour. Finally, we'd like to invite all of you, and the ushers will guide you, to collect a little toli and a blessing card, something to keep you sweet and something to take away with you on your way home. Thank you very much. Om Shanti.